much for joining us. Um, yeah, I'm Jenny Foster. I'm project lead at the Global Goals Centre. Uh, we're working to create the world's first immersive centre, which brings to life the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And in the meantime, we're creating engaging experiences to really engage people um, and educate people to take action for a fairer, greener future. Um, and that's why we wanted to host this event today. And we're delighted to have um, our panel with us. Um, we are probably aware that we are hosting this event on the eve of the G7, where the world leaders are gathering in Cornwall to discuss climate and international development issues. And so we really wanted to hear young people's and educators' voices on these really vital subjects and to really mobilize action to make sure that our education system is fit for purpose. Now through the session, um, there is the opportunity to add your thoughts and questions and ideas, and we'd really, really like you to do that. So um, you can see at the bottom, um, there is uh, the Q&A function. You can click on that and add any questions that you want to ask of our panelists at any time throughout uh, the session. Um, and I'm also just adding into the chat box now a link to a Jamboard, um, which if you want to add on there, again, any ideas that you want to share with other people, any resources that you think other people should know about that can help with climate education or equality education, um, it would be absolutely fantastic to share that um, on that board. And I will be sharing that a bit later um, and we can send it out to everybody afterwards as well. So please do add to that, that link is there in the chat for you to use. So I'd now like to introduce our panel. Um, we are going to plough on, even though Maya Rose Craig hasn't managed to join us yet, but she, I hopefully she will join us later and we can hear from her when she is able to be part of us. So you probably know that she is a prominent birder, conservationist and environmentalist and the youngest person to be awarded um, a doc doctorate, honorary doctorate from the University of Bristol. Um, for her work fighting for equal access to nature and for ethnic diversity in the environmental sector. And she's just released a book um, about young BPOC environmentalists around the world called We Have a Dream. So keep a lookout for that. Also very delighted to welcome Manu Manganeza. He was a teacher for 10 years and he's now the education and community lead at the Global Goal Centre with me. He set up and runs Nature Youth Connection and Education which provides ecological education for marginalised young people in Bristol. Manu is a director of Bristol Green Capital Partnership, focusing on engaging young people and other diverse communities with nature and the environment. And he's also a resident at the Pervasive Media Studio, a man of many hats. Welcome, Manu. And we also have with us Dr. Julian Brown, who's a lecturer in the School of Education at the University of Bristol. Julian taught maths for 15 years in secondary schools and at a sixth form college, leading two math departments. And he's currently part of many research networks locally, nationally and internationally, considering how curriculum innovations can respond to issues of global challenge, equity and sustainability. Welcome to you, Julian. So I think we're all here because we know that we need to change our current education curriculum to address the vital issues of climate justice and inequality. But rather than hear it from me, I thought I'd hand over to one of the world's largest lessons youth ambassadors just to inspire us on our way. Hello, I am Mithi Jonal Khan, a climate justice activist based in Manila, Philippines. I became an activist in 2017 when I was able to talk to an indigenous leader from our country and learn about the challenges that they face as a community because of the climate crisis. I realized then that I had to join the fight for our planet and for our life. Do we want climate justice? Do we want that? No! I learned about the climate crisis in school, but there was a disconnect between what I was being taught inside the classroom and what I saw happening to people where I live. It just didn't add up. My education didn't look at the social justice issues of climate change at all. How can we take action and work together if everyone is not equally informed about what is happening? The only way to do this is to make sure that everyone gets empowering and relevant climate and ecological education in their school curriculum. It is our right as young people to learn about the climate crisis. 
a lot of countries promised to implement learning about it by committing to the Paris Agreement and the Global Goals. We need to see this happen in every country around the world. What would it mean if we all did learn? What would happen? Imagine what we could all do if we were all empowered by knowledge. Okay, so with those words ringing in our ears, I'd like to hand over to um, the first of our panelists, Julian, if we could start with you. And the question that we put to our panelists was, what changes do we need to make to our education system to enable young people to be equipped for climate and equality realities? Over to you, Julian. Thanks, Jenny. Um, it's really great to be part of this this afternoon and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so we've got some big questions here. Uh, I think um, thinking about what needs to change in the education system kind of begs quite a big question about purposes of the education system, I suppose, in the first place. I've had this quote um, going around for me from Carl Sagan, um, which he wrote in a book 30 years ago about um, humans moving into space. Uh, he talked about humans becoming more powerful without becoming more wise um, and talked about how we now require this degree of consideration and foresight that, that's never been asked of us before. And I say that's 30 years ago, but it feels like it's just so resonant for me um, still now. Um, so thinking about changes to the education system and with, with Mitzi's word from that video um, ringing in our ears, I think um, for me, there's sort of three things that I, I would argue for at this level. One, one is uh, around particularly England catching up with, with our neighbours, with Scotland and Wales, actually, in terms of the centrality with which we hold education for sustainable development and equity. I, I think as well, there's something around changing the, the qualification landscape uh, to act as a sort of a lever for, for making those changes uh, more permanent in schools. And I'd also argue for um, making changes that allow teachers who are really keen to, to be making changes to the way that they are operating, to have spaces where those changes can, can really connect up with what's coming in for, for new teachers, teachers just, just beginning. Um, so I'll, I'll try and be brief, but I thought I'd start by saying what I wanted to, to say at the end, because uh, I, I will otherwise run out of time. So. Um, the government in England, Nick Gibb, who's the schools minister and has been for a while, talked recently in a speech about education being for equipping young people to make contributions to the economy and to the culture. And those things I think I can see lots of positives in, but, but it feels to me like it's a little bit um, paltry, really. It's a little bit deficient compared with what we can see happening in, in Scotland and Wales. And actually, if any of you we're in the Teacher Fest event on Monday with Graham Donaldson. You'll have heard this expressed much more eloquently than I'm going to, because he was directly involved in making some of these changes. But Scotland's curriculum for excellence that's been re fairly recently introduced the last few years has learning for su sustainability as a central theme. It's got it as a core part of the teacher's professional standards in Scotland now. And similarly, in, in Wales, Wales has been introducing, uh, working towards introducing a new curriculum to, to, to really take effect in a year's time. Um, it has four central aims, one of which is helping young people become ethical and informed citizens. It's really clear. And in fact, it builds up on, on uh, themes of education for sustainable development and global citizenship that Wales has been working with since 2008 in their national curriculum. So one thing that I would argue, echoing Mitzi's words about the Paris Agreement back in December 2015 and in the Sustainability Development Goals, uh, um, that, that there's a role here for a much greater uh, emphasis, certainly in the English national curriculum, to catch up. Um, Italy is the first country actually who's, who's implemented their a law to make climate change education compulsory for all children in schools or, and young people. So every, every young person in a school in Italy will have a minimum of 33 hours of climate change education a year um, from, from last September onwards. But we've got some catching up to do there, I think, on a national scale. Um, 
I think also I'd want to, to talk about the qualifications landscape. Uh, so in schools, the reality in secondary schools just is that quite a lot of what happens on a day by day, week by week basis is driven by what's happening in GCSEs and A-levels. Um, this is a, a, a really slow process. Um, just this week, the um, Cambridge Assessment were, have, have been talking about a new GCSE uh, for natural history. I think it's really exciting. Um, and it's getting to the point of being adopted as a GCSE course but it's taken 11 years for them to get to this stage. So it's a long process. I am, um, I, I, I'm, I'm privileged to be involved at the very early stages at the moment of a few other projects linked with uh, national organizations for geography and for mathematics about other qualifications, but it's a long process. However, I do feel that there's a role for this um, in, in, as a, in a way of making this sort of more sustainable um, in schools, these changes. And the third thing that I was saying, I'll try and be really brief, and I think Manu's maybe, maybe going to pick up on some of these ideas. There are things happening in initial teacher education contexts now. So people who are training to be teachers now are getting more input in terms of what is possible for bringing into subject areas and between subject areas for working on issues of education for sustainable development and for equity. And somehow, um, I would say there's a, there's a need for a change to allow those beginnings to really bloom and to connect in with other teachers who are also really excited and with young people who are excited about seeing changes happening in schools. So those are three areas that I, I picked out just at sort of a, quite a, a policy level um, around curriculum. If I can take five more seconds, just on a sidebar. Curriculum, I think, is curriculum is much more than policy documents. I just want to make that really clear that in my, I really argue strongly, curriculum is about everything that happens in a school environment. It's about how people get to school, what they eat, the, the spaces they, they're in in between lessons. But I'm, I'm just focused there for, for, for this purpose on, on that sort of policy level. That's great, Julian. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just, I'm, um, Maya Rose is actually on her way to the G7 in Cornwall and hasn't got any 4G on the road. So I was just messaging her the number to dial in so that she can actually speak to us. So apologies for my slight delay there in, uh, in cutting in. So thank you. That is just incredibly helpful and very, very clear. Um, could I ask you, Manu, now to give your um, input onto that question? That's fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Jenny, and uh, thanks for um, everybody that's turned up today. And uh, thank you, Julian. You touched on so many, so many interesting points. I almost feel like I have nothing to say now. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I'll start off with a with a story of uh, when I was teaching in secondary school uh, three years ago, and I wanted to encourage my my students to think about creative writing. And they were thirteen years old, and we. Um, and I found out that we had a biomass boiler that heated the whole school. And so, and I went down to it and it looked like a, like a spaceship down there, you know, big pipes everywhere, this roaring inferno breathing thing. And I thought, you know, we'll do a science fiction horror creative writing project. And uh, so we went down there as a class and I'd asked the maintenance person to turn off the lights once we're, once we're all in there as a bit of a scare. And um, everybody screamed for about five seconds. A little bit more than that would have uh, put a taint on my safeguarding uh, record. So, and what came out of it was not just the creative writing exercise, but it was questions about why was that boiler different from the one we have at home? What is biomass? How does it work? How does it heat up the space that's made for 500 people? And I, I like telling that story because it came as a surprise to me that the thing we most focused on was where the energy that heated up the school was from because our biomass boiler failed very often. Uh, it, was a, it was an early model. And, but I pick up on that story because it's a story that speaks to that in the interim, before the changes that Julian is talking about to the actual curriculum happen, which can take a very long time, there are many opportunities for us to embed ideas 
of environment and climate into the things that we're already allowed to teach, into the things that we already have to put a tick box next to. And I think that requires training. I think that requires teachers to have a certain level of confidence in the fact that they can be teaching a geography lesson and bring up issues of inequality. They can be thinking about how the ecosystems of the world work uh, in tandem together. They can be teaching a history lesson and be thinking about how the industrial revolution was the beginning of our dependency on fossil fuels. They can be teaching an English lesson like I was teaching and be thinking about the ways in which we heat up our buildings. And so it's finding those opportunities within the curriculum as, as it is. It is encouraging uh, that bravery among, among teachers and showing that it's not actually a lot of extra work to do that. And often it brings up a lot of creative solutions to the way in which we teach. I think another thing that happens in the teaching of climate and environment and social justice issues is that we often rely so much on them being siloed into science or siloed into this or siloed into that. And one of the problems with our curriculum is that siloing of subjects where actually a teacher looking at economics, say at A-level, doesn't get the opportunity to look um, within supply and demand at the ways in which we uh, procure our clothes from halfway across the world and what went into that. So encouraging a sense of broad thinking and deep thinking and exploration uh, among teachers, that also requires training, but I don't think it is that much training. I think most adults are able to see those connections, but unfortunately, when we enter the classroom, we don't feel we have the time or we have the permission to then make those connections. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is that the issues of the environment and the issues of climate change and the issues of social justice that are related to it, they're not separate from the subjects that we are supposed to teach. And they're not separate from the concerns of the young people in front of us. And so gaining some leverage in the things that young people are already interested in and the things that are real for them when they step outside of the school building gives us a lot of opportunity for engagement. And then to uh, add on to the point that Julian was, um, was talking about, education and going into a school, school building for 35 hours a week requires us to think about what kind of food are the young people eating in the lunch hall? Is that an opportunity for educating them about sustainable food production, sustainable food procurement? Um, what are the foods we're allowing them to bring in? Is recycling something that they're involved in as part of the class activity? Are the pictures that are on our walls promoting uh, ethical engagement with, uh, with the world around them? And finally, to, to, to finish off, and after that, we've got after school clubs and we've got ways of engaging with young people in projects that they can do outside of the, the classroom. And young people, uh, I think we've got Maya Rosa on now uh, and she'll, she'll probably testify to the fact she's, she's a good 14 years younger than me, I think or so. And uh, but she'll testify to the fact, hopefully, that young people know more about most of these issues than we do. And so relying on what I think is an old fashioned system of one directional teaching where I have the knowledge and I'm siphoning it off to you doesn't really work when we're thinking about climate justice and social justice and equality. Because often by co-producing with the young people, by co-producing with them and allowing them to bring their ideas to the fore, we get so many opportunities for them teaching each other for them seeing the enthusiasm that exists within uh, their cohort around a lot of those issues. And, um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manu. That's very, very valuable. And it's great to hear both of you talking so positively about what can be done. I think so often we kind of get a little bit handicapped by the limitations that are put on us. And obviously it's really important that we can um, 
we can actually look for those opportunities. I'm sure some teachers maybe in the uh, in the room might have some questions around that. But before we do that, um, Maya, I'm going to ask you, um, it's wonderful that you've joined us. Thank you so much for joining us from the road. I'm sure you're a bit hot and fed up on the M5 or wherever you are at the moment. Um, so if you can unmute yourself and speak to us at this moment, that'd be fantastic. Right, hello. Um, I'll just speak for a moment while I still have some 4G. I'm very sorry. Um, I'm actually on my way down to protest um, at G7 at the moment with Extinction Rebellion and the road was a bit more clogged up than expected. Um, yeah, just honking at the, um, the XR signs that have been strung across the road. Um, but yeah, I think um, there's various things. To, I mean, to speak about uh, G7 explicitly, I think there's so many different factors, but personally, as a young person, the emotion that I'm running into all the time is just frustration. And because it's just so incredibly upsetting issues like climate change and other environmental things, um, just because I at least am very aware that these could have been solved literally decades ago. Um, and yet it's my generation, my, gen my generation's future that has been sacrificed and essentially being sent down the drain because of greed and prioritizing things like money and short termism and the economy over the prioritization of environmental issues. Um, and so I guess for me, that's why I'm going down today. That's why I'm currently in the car, very sorry, instead of being able to speak properly. Um, I think as well, something that's incredibly person, um, important to me personally, which I'm really excited about because it's being prioritized a lot at these upcoming protests that I'm going to, is global climate justice in terms of uh, um, our climate change movement. By the way, I'm so sorry if I'm repeating anything, um, but I think something that is so incredibly important is the prioritization of voices from the global south and the experiences of people from the global south. Um, because so often environmental movements in general, including the climate change movement, have come from this incredibly Western perspective um, where, you know, it's coming, it's all to do with, you know, capitalism and consumerism and greed, where a lot of the people who are currently suffering and dealing with climate change aren't really to blame for any of that. And so I think it's incredibly important to keep all of that in mind when we're talking about issues like climate change. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting going forward at things like COP26 to see if countries in the global south that are dealing with the realities of climate change right now are going to be prioritized in the conversation. I think the fact, arguably, even that G7 has so much control over the future of the planet, um, despite them all being very wealthy, very Western countries, is very questionable, in my opinion. Um, and I know that many other young people feel the same. And so I feel... Um, yeah, that global climate justice has to be at the centre of everything. And I think a lot of other young people that I know truly do feel that intersectionality is everything when it comes to the climate change movement and that without it, we can't be sustainable. Um, so I guess if anything comes away from with it, sorry, if anyone comes away with anything from today is that we need an intersectional sustainable movement that is hearing everyone's voices. Thank you so much, Maya. That's really, really inspiring. Would you be able to um, tell us what you think the education system needs to do to catch up with some of this thinking? Because everything you've said, you know, wholeheartedly agree with. Um, but it isn't, I'm sure you realise, being taught in schools at the moment, although some teachers, of course, are absolutely doing their best. What can we push for in our education system to try to bring about the change that you're highlighting is necessary? I mean, when <laughs> I'm only 19 and when I went to secondary school until I was about 15, I wasn't even taught that climate change was the definite truth of what our planet was experiencing. It was just a theory as to what was going on. And I think that's very telling um, in and of itself. I think, um, to be honest, the goals of the Global Goal Center in general are basically where my priorities lie. And I think it's really important to just be having really honest, explicit conversations with kids, with young people um, about the future of the planet. At the moment, there was a study done recently showing that four out of five of kids um, aged sort of seven, eight-ish were dealing with eco-anxiety. And so this isn't the issue of um, children not really knowing or understanding um, 
you know, environmental issues, the state of the planet with, that we're dealing with, if anything, I think it is giving them hope and showing young people that there is hope and there is possibility for the future. Um, and I think that can be done in really small ways. For example, taking your kids to, um, you know, youth strikes and showing them all the other people there who also care about and are worried about the same issues, pointing out occasionally when there is good news, because I think that isn't highlighted enough. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, remembering that these are children that we're talking to and arguably it isn't really the responsibility of children and young people, um, you know, to fight for their future. They should be in school. They should be learning. They should be enjoying their lives. And so I think, um, honestly, my hope for the future is that these kids who are still in primary school at the moment won't have to worry about climate change or other issues by the time they're my age. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. That's absolutely brilliant. Are you able to stay on for a little bit just for a few questions? That's great. If uh, we yeah. lose you, we completely understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've only actually got one question in the Q&A box, but please keep do adding them, uh, people, because we, you know, we want to be able to give you your voice. So the question that we've got comes from Georgie Thompson. Um, slightly controversially worded perhaps, but um, it says, how much of a barrier does a far right Tory government represent to sustainable initiatives within education if they critique capitalism as well as the narrowing of the curriculum? Quite a lot in there. I don't know who would like to answer that first. Yeah, Maya, go for it. Um, I, I personally think that that's a really important question because at the end of the day, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with now do come from consumerism and they do come from capitalism. And that isn't something that aligns with the priorities of our current government. And there's not really a lot that you can say to combat that. And so I think really what we need is wider systemic change in general. Um, because I think, you know, the way that we're living at the moment is not sustainable. And I think that is such an important message to um, convey to young people, especially with the rise of the internet, where things like overconsumption are constantly con culturally being really pushed. And so I think uh, my two cents, at least, is that I think that that's going to be something really difficult going forward. And that might have to be something that's done externally outside of government mandated curriculum. So it's just not going to happen in the next few years, at least. That's really helpful. Thank you. Anything from you, Manu or Julian, to add to that? Well, I, I have one one reflection just, just straight off the back of, of Maya Rose's comment about the um, externally mandated curriculum. So there's something around, um, well, schools have been given the opportunity on paper anyway, to define their own local curriculum. So it's like, this is what this school says it's about and what it's doing for the children and young people in this area. Um, and um, that's been that's been sort of stated as part of, I suppose, you know, again, sort of at the systems level, that's that's something that that the school's inspector, that Ofsted, would come into a school and say, so what what's your curriculum about? What's your curriculum intent? Is the sort of the jargon. Um, what what my observation would be is that there's very few schools or very few school leadership teams who feel that they can really pick that up and run with it and realize that in a way that that does make a difference locally so there's some there, there are these pressures that that still fit seem to seem to say that school leaders feel constrained to not step outside that externally mandated curriculum that my rose was talking about um, so there's something that we've got to, that, that that could be unlocked you know there's there's a space there but it's that there, there are these constraints something perhaps around the the nature or the framing of the accountability models that we have um in the in the country certainly in england um uh that that act as inhibitors and, and perhaps something that we could look at is maybe well how how do we how do schools get supported to to break three of those those sort of constraining influences it's still a systems issue um at this level but there is there is scope within the system, but there are breaks on, on individual schools seeming to make use of those. Thank you, Julian. And if anyone's got any ideas or if they know of a school that has perhaps taken that brave step of 
um, saying that the aim of their curriculum, and this is what our school is working to, is social and environmental justice, then we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Do post something on the on the Jamboard. Um, I'll put that link in the chat again um, or, or put it in the in the Q&A for us to follow up. Um, Manu, did you want to say anything about that question? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Georgie. Uh, I love the way you've uh, you've termed it. Uh, I won't say whether I agree or disagree with uh, the way you've, <laughs> you've put that question. You can probably guess. Um, I think I think you know the points that Julian and Maya have raised are, are are very valid and important. You know, it's things things need to happen outside of the top down school curriculum system that we have. Despite Julian's point, it is a very top down uh, system. Teachers' time. Uh, I can sympathize with teachers having done been in that space for for ten years is so limited, so limited to to delivery um, and uh, planning and planning towards that delivery that there isn't enough time to think about how to do things differently. And I think that's something that is a funding issue as much as as anything else. I think there are a lot of amazing people out there who, uh, would want to get into teaching but we have a situation at the moment where I think the last thing I read was the average amount of time that a, a new teacher stays in the profession for is 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 tiny it's it's it, you know it's single digit years right in a, in a profession that used to that used to be a lifelong thing in a profession that most people get into for passion rather than money and so I think there are a lot of funding issues with how much time do teachers have to consider um, using the, the affordances that exist within the system to actually look at how do you embed, how do you uh, think outside of the box. And, and we shouldn't discount uh, Georgie's question based on the, uh, on the far right bit that's in there. Uh, the political atmosphere in which we operate has a massive influence on how us as individuals, us as schools, us as organizations, um, can, can normalize certain things. And having grown up both in Zimbabwe, which has a completely different political atmosphere to, uh, to the United Kingdom, I know the restrictions on people's lives there, which are different to the restrictions on people's lives here and the expectations of professionals, uh, teachers, doctors, nurses, based on that political atmosphere. And I would say, as I, as I always say when thinking about uh, equality and inclusion, uh, that exclusion, for example, is a political issue and inclusion also has to be a political and active issue. And I think linking up teachers across cities, linking up teachers across, uh, across the country who are thinking about these issues and giving them a platform to talk about it creates a, a, a platform of resistance which is necessary to show that, you know, you've got thousands of teachers across the country who would want to be doing things differently. At the present moment, there isn't the sharing of resources, there isn't the sharing of ideas uh, and best practice, um, which means that people often feel stuck, often feel isolated, often feel alone because um, the ideas seem out of, you know, seem left field. So finding a way of doing that is, I think is, is, is also important in resisting the pressures that are coming from the top. Yeah, go for it, Julian. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading in, I don't know whether it's your intention, Georgie, but I'm, I'm reading in the question as well, a, a link back to the, um, the announcement, what was it, eight, nine months ago, about um, schools not making use of resources from organisations that are on this list of extreme in their words extreme organizations uh and that for me i'm getting that from the link in your question georgie from um, capitalism but actually i think that one of the things that would be most valuable is excuse me most valuable that that, that is offered in schools is supporting uh supporting a critical engagement with the world i, I think that is so huge and i think um, I completely, completely agree with, with Manu's points about pressures on, on teachers' time and on space for delivery. So where there are teachers who are looking for opportunities to, to build in this kind of 
critical thinking. And by critical thinking, I, I don't mean just criticizing, right? I mean, the ability to look at issues from multiple perspectives, the ability to, to sift and weigh lots of evidence that's coming in lots of different ways in order to think about taking a principled stance. So I, 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 I'd see that as being one of the most valuable spaces that we could look to open up in schools. But and, and I, I completely, completely accept and support Manu's kind of um, implicit, if I can, if I can read it this way, implicit uh, appeal for for that support to be real in schools with teachers having more time to do this kind of thing, which is a which is a definitely a funding issue. That's brilliant. And we'll, we'll come on slightly later to sort of our asks and let's just hold that thought for that. Um, I'll just get on through a few more questions if we can. Um, Maya, I'm hoping you're still there, even though your camera's off, because we've got a question from um, Alex, um, age 15. He says, how did you initially become so strongly involved with climate change and ethnic equality and access to wildlife and the environment? You're, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, in terms of how I got involved with stuff, I've always been environmental issues. I've always, you know, gone outside and stuff like that. And I started a blog when I was about 11, which people just happened to read. I think that's the magical power of the internet. Um, but personally, climate change has always been something that I've been very aware of and very concerned about since I was a kid, which I think is a very universal experience. Um, and so I guess almost there was never really a single moment where I got really interested in climate change stuff just because it's always been like I know it is very corny but it always has been the issue of a generation um, and obviously then all the explosion of stuff happened in 2018 with you know youth strikes and Greta Thunberg and um, you know if people are asking for advice I think it's incredibly easy to get involved in climate change stuff these days um, genuinely people are so welcoming they're always looking for new people to add into the community um, so if you're thinking about getting involved I was 100% recommend and it's also great at helping with um, eco-anxiety um, and in terms of the uh, diversity stuff I think a lot of that genuinely just came from the experience of being someone who is not white in an incredibly white space um, I have always gone out into nature I have always had a very strong connection to nature in the countryside and therefore the environmental movement and so I became very aware relatively young that there were massive issues with inequality and it was never really on purpose when I was younger but I did end up um, you know run, starting my charity back to nature and starting our camps which ended up here almost like pioneering a wider diversity movement that I think has been so so important and is going to be going forward I genuinely think we need to engage everyone from every walk of life um, for this to be a really successful movement um, but yeah thank you for the question that's brilliant thank you I hope you've got a few um, inspiring ideas there Alex to get involved if you're not already I'm sure you are um, but I think your point there Maya about it actually really helps with the eco-anxiety to get involved with other groups and young people involved because it absolutely you know means that you're doing something positive rather than just sitting back getting depressed about it so so thank you for that it's really really helpful um, got a couple more questions coming up now so uh, we've got a question from Kevin Thomas who says what are the key barriers to schools embedding sessions on environment and social justice within their timetables um, could I start with you on Julian on that one yeah I think um, Kevin I, thank you for that I think uh, and I've just seen your message on the chat as well which was uh, which is also really um, really helpful I think uh, I'm, I'm just gonna hope that's okay Kevin I'm just gonna read your your message on the chat hope it's all right Jenny um, yes cool so um, one planet matters ran environmental workshops in a range of schools and colleges pre-pandemic what became apparent is just how difficult it was even if the school was interested uh, in which department was responsible some were done as extracurricular others as tutorials etc um, this perhaps highlights a key problem of where exactly environmental and social justice sits. And I think you've, you've, uh, you're drawing those two, two themes together feels, um, feels, yeah, like making a really powerful point. So thank you for those. Key barriers to, to schools embedding sessions. Um, I think this, this does link into some of the areas that we've already discussed. So um, there's something here about 
whether these changes come from enthusiastic individual teachers or whether they are um, uh, things that are happening with the momentum, the, the um, backing or the driving force of school leadership teams. Um, so I would say that the, one of the key barriers that's been expressed um, in, with some of the, the teachers with whom I've worked is that they essentially run out of energy and because it's a, an enthusiastic individual teacher looking to make, um, looking to make, uh, introduce new ways of working in their school and sustaining that is, um, is a real challenge in terms of energy. So, so one alternative model um, is that there is somebody in the school, in a school leadership team who is given the role of taking the lead of issues of social justice and equity and sustainable development. So I think, um, and we have, we have one local model of that, um, which seems to be working really well. Uh, but I think there's, there is this issue then of, of how, to, how we support interested individual teachers in schools uh, in order to sustain that energy. Um, I would argue that another way of, of trying to remove those barriers would be to have a um, required explicit space on the school timetable, which is to address issues of sustainable development and equity. Uh, and then we're getting into to issues of what gets prioritised in the curriculum time in the school, I guess. Brilliant, thank you. Manu, did you want to add anything in terms of the, the barriers and potentially how to overcome them as well? Yeah, I think, I think, I think Julian has touched on uh, some of the same points that I, that I would have wanted to raise and points that I would have wanted to raise when I was teaching. Um, the point of having somebody who looks after the delivery and I guess design of um, of parts of learning around environmental and social justice, I think it's it, it's great. It's it's we've got head the heads of department uh, for all other subjects, and we've got teachers who will take a lead role in pastoral care in all of those sorts of issues. And I think beginning the training with one member of staff who does have that enthusiasm is a great step. What happens when that member of staff leaves? Um, you know, that's that's the second bit. And so I think it's it's finding ways of co-mentoring within schools. It's finding ways of uh, building uh, sustainable partnerships that with external organizations that have a better knowledge pool around these issues so that they can also be a touch point when schools are thinking about how, how to deliver um, that, you know, that, that content. And then I, you know, I'd like to get back to, I guess, the point that I've made in my initial remarks around environmental and social justice can be subject, they can sit on their own, and it's difficult to know where they sit in what department they sit, especially at secondary school level. But I firmly believe that with the right amount of training and focus on it, they can sit within any subject. They can sit within any topic that is being delivered because we have to start thinking about these issues not as a subject that is over there. Um, now we're doing a climate change session or now we're doing a social justice session. We have to start thinking, how can you get away with doing a human geography lesson without thinking about the impact of uh, flood levels in Bangladesh on people's opportunities in life? How can you start delivering a lesson on combustion in chemistry without thinking about uh, the way in which we burn fossil fuels and pollute our planet? You know, So we have to start thinking of them, not just as sessions, because I think that's important for, for kids to know that these things are being given the importance that they have their own subject or their own time in the day, but also embedding them within the within within the lesson within the within the things that we're already teaching 
that's so valuable and um obviously that's the ideal i guess it's kind of easier said than done and that, that brings me on to the next question which is from um john worcester and he asks how impactful do you see covid in the long term being on the implementation of a school-wide climate driven curriculum already curriculum redesigns have been put on pause because of tags and various lockdowns how might you combat any Im impacts who wants to start with that one i'll pass it on to julian to start <laughs> That's such, such a good question yeah it's such a good question um i mean we were um we were actually talking just just before the start of this meeting about how all of us and actually those who are here who are um who are who are students in in the audience you probably got your own perspective on this as well but certainly that that our experience of working with teachers is that it's been a really really grueling kind of year um so coming up with all, all the work around these teacher assessed grades and so on for the gcse's and a levels it, it's just really been quite overwhelming i think in 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 many ways um so yeah this this feels like it's just um another um ask in a way of these um of, of of you of people who are enthusiastic and engaged uh uh and i don't really want to to load more on on you as enthusiastic individuals as as teachers um so it's possible that we can look at what's just what's just happened in and to schools uh and, and try to pick out some affordances some things that we are we might be able to take out of, of this as benefits in terms of uh, looking at um, curriculum in different ways. I think one thing that it has brought to the fore is um, that maybe schools have realized in a different way. And when I say schools, I'm, I'm thinking organizationally and maybe individual teachers as well. And also maybe students have realized in a different way how it's possible to connect um across distances uh, and that might in turn mean that we can start to offer uh offer opportunities that that maybe we wouldn't have thought of two years ago so um, and one thing i've got in mind for example is a a, a, a partnership project be between uh teachers who are at the start of their career but in in bristol and in hong kong and um, those, so we did something that happened last year. So those teachers were talking together about what could they do um, that is enabled by technology to respond to issues of global challenge in their local context. So essentially, how can a teacher in, in Hong Kong who um, might have particular concerns around, let's say, air quality in their local environment connect with a teacher in Bristol um, who may have similar concerns or may have different local manifestations of the same kind of concerns to support each other as another way of creating these networks. Um, and I, I wonder whether that might be something that, that releases us into some new possibilities. Uh, I, think, I think there are lots of spaces as well where people are sharing things. It's great actually to see so much already coming on the Padlet. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a load of other stuff that's arriving, but things things that allow us to connect as professionals into, in professional communities to support and share ideas, these kinds of networks that might might be emerging. I'm not trying to downplay the challenge here, though. I think John's question really does point to something that's a real challenge at this point in time. And, and I, I suppose I'd want to say on this on the back of that, that I, I wouldn't want teachers to be feeling guilty about what is and isn't proving possible right now. Um, there is an urgency around this and there's a need to, to, to sustain ourselves, picking up on Manu's point about teachers leaving the profession. Brilliant, thank you, Julian. Did you want to add anything, Manu? I just, I just wanted to say, and uh, that kind of came to my mind as Julian was talking about technology that you know, the, the fact that we are now sitting all in our own spaces and being able to talk to each other with, you know, relative ease, you know, except for those going down to G7, trying to, <laughs> trying to find G4 signal, um, is, 
you know, this, this was not really a possibility or something on the horizon for a lot of people and a lot of schools and a lot of teachers uh, just over a year ago. I didn't even know what Zoom was. And I think what, um, if anything has come out of COVID for me that, that, that perhaps has some level of positivity to it is that we don't have to get on a plane to go to Australia to figure out what's going on in Australia. We can have conversations with people in this way. We can connect with teachers in other places. We can connect our young people with schools in, in Africa, in Asia, in South America that are at the, you know, that are at the forefront of the effects of climate change and be able to have conversations like that. I was recently involved in a, in a thing that a, a teacher friend was doing, talking to a family uh, in, um, in, sorry, in Senegal, I was gonna say Sudan, in Senegal, and talking to that family as they walked around their, uh, their field, their, where, where they grow their, their, their crops. And I thought, when I was teaching, this would never have happened. I never would have thought of this because you know, what I would have been thinking about is trying to raise 10,000 pounds for, for two of my students to fly out there and do some damage on their way and, you know, and then bring back a report. So, yeah, so hopefully there's, there's little bits of some of the things that have come out through COVID that allow us some of those opportunities. But I'm totally on board with Julian's point. It is not easy. And a lot of this is going to give us a lot, of, a lot more stress as teachers, as educators, because you know all the catch-up stuff that's going on is not focused on social justice, on environmental justice, on climate education. It's focused on the same old stuff that we've always had pressure to teach. So I sympathize, and I hope through connecting and 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 again networking and seeing how other people are doing it across the country and having those platforms, that you know some solutions start to come up. Brilliant, thank you. Um, before we move on to what the solutions are and what we're going to ask local education leaders to look at as a result of this session, um, it'd be, I'm just going to uh, launch a poll and it'd be brilliant if everybody can take part in this. I hope you can all see that. Um, there's five questions. Um, so if you can just do your um, voting, obviously the first one is just fairly factual and then after that it's um, just your input about whether you think you've um, what you've learned or taught about climate and equality. So um, if you just click on the answer, that should um, give you the access to the poll. So um, can everybody see that and able to vote? Yes, nods, excellent. So if you can, oh yeah, lovely, that's coming through. I'll just keep that open for a little while. So give everyone a chance to click on their answers. So there's five questions if you can scroll down and get through them. Brilliant, I'll just leave it open for another few seconds. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking part in that. Got a few more people, maybe, to take part. Yeah, still coming up. OK, so I'm going to end the polling now and just share the results. So great to see a number of young people in the room. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, not many primary teachers, but quite a few secondaries. And um, how much have you taught or learned about climate issues in the past 12 months? Um, I'm very reassured to see that nobody has said not at all. So that's great. Um, but overridingly, it's kind of occasionally, but not enough, which I think has obviously come out in our discussion about how difficult it is at the moment to, to put that in. Um, in a meaningful way on a regular basis in our current curriculum. Do you have the resources you need to teach or learn about um, climate issues? Um, 
overwhelmingly people would like more. Um, and I think that's definitely something we would like to help with at Global Goals Centre. We're working with um, Climate Change Education Research Network to, to build up a really um, comprehensive library of resources and things that are very interactive and, and engaging, not just sort of information sources. So we hope we'll be able to, uh, to help you with that and certainly to share that with you in the coming months. Um, how much have you taught or learned about equalities and racial in injustice? Again, similar kinds of figures. Um, and it seems that the resources on that is actually even scarcer. So that's absolutely something that we will look to add to our resource bank. Um, we're doing some work on refugees and climate migration, and obviously racial equality is all part of that. So we will look to build up our resources to be able to share with you so that you can have more um, moving forwards to help with your teaching. So thank you so much for taking part in that. And um, that was that's really interesting, thank you. So what I'm gonna ask of our panelists now, and please again, do put any more questions or, or put in the chat about uh, any, any imp inputs that you would like to add to this. And the question is, what, what do we want to ask of our local education decision makers? So we have Fiona here from the Bristol Education Partnerships, got access into the Bristol Learning City team. I'm presenting at the Children and Young People's Board, part of the One City um, plan um, next month. And I would really like to take some key asks from this session about um, how these issues can be embedded in the curriculum. So how can we lobby for positive change? What are our asks? If I can ask um, both Julian and Manu to comment, and I say, please do put any comments of your own in the chat and I'll try to bring those up. Manu, if we start with you this time, maybe. Uh, yeah, um, my, my list is, uh, is, you know, is, is, is dozens of things, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, 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 try, I'll try and keep it to, to a couple if, uh, if that's possible. Uh, I think I come back to the point of how we embed um, the issues of environmental and social justice into the curriculum that we have as it is. And I think that requires training, that requires uh, resources in terms of financial resources to allow for, for teachers to do that, to allow for people who have knowledge of how to, how to do that to be able to deliver it. And I think it requires um, some sort of way of sharing uh, the success stories of doing that so that other teachers are inspired uh, in doing that. All of that requires resource. All of that requires um, giving, you know, key thinkers within education the, the time to, to figure out how that works within the current context. And, and it requires teachers to have, to have extra training to do, you know, to have the time to do the extra training uh, to do so. And so that would, be, that would be my first ask because I think changing the curriculum itself is going to take such a long time uh, to do and is, is an arduous process. But I think in the immediate term, if we, if schools were resourced to, to be able to gain access to that training, that would be an amazing thing. I think the other thing that happens is that because teaching in this country, you know, 90% plus of teachers went through a PGCE and, you know, and you qualify to become a teacher, um, but at the same time do not always have the necessary knowledge uh, on, the arising issues of environmental and social justice, or at least we're not given the training on how to deliver that. I think resourcing schools uh, in a way that allows them to work with external partners, to work with external organizations and companies on a regular basis for the delivery of um, workshops and, and, and bits of training, um, that meet that would be would be an amazing thing. It would be it would be so great if every school in Bristol had uh, in their budget ways of working with you know with experts in the field of sixteen year olds gaining mentoring from environmentalists and con conservation conservationists and uh, and and other leading thinkers within that uh, within those fields. Um, at the moment, they don't have that resource. 
uh, and when they do, it's having to be siphoned off from another part of the budget. It's having to be taken from an EHCP place so that, you know, those kids are, you know, all, all of that. And I think, I think that's a, that would be an amazing resource for schools to, to have. That's brilliant. And given that Bristol is obviously the first city to declare a climate emergency and we set very tough targets for ourselves to meet net zero by 2030, um, it would seem that actually enabling teachers and schools to be part of that solution is, is absolutely makes sense. Thank you, Manu. Julian, did you want to add? Uh, I think that's um, a great set of asks um, from Manu. Uh, um, quite a few things that I had on my list there as well. So um, I, I'm aware that quite a lot of what I've said seems to be, seems to have been framed about what's happening within a school. So I was really uh, appreciative of hearing that prompt to think about making use of partners outside school. And I'm minded of, a, of something I heard just this week from somebody who actually is on uh, the PTC course where I work about a school in Bristol where they just um, had an engineering company that had come in to do some project work around sustainable, uh, I think it was sustainable energy generation with students in the school. So, so there are clearly or organizations to support training uh, and development as, as Manu said, and other partners um, who are interested in being engaged in schools. So I suppose one ask I, I would have is, is well, how, how are schools going to know about that? So, so a way of connecting together, and it feels like um, the, the council might, might be the hub, uh, but a way of connecting together those who are offering those opportunities and schools. Um, I, I'm really, I, I was really excited about the Bristol Education Partnership Climate Project that, um, that brought together uh, the climate challenge project that brought together people from across schools in, in Bristol and I know that that was something that I well I believe that's something that was in within the Bristol Education Partnership so I, I am also really interested in well what can be done to, to, to broaden that out to, to make that same model um, available and drawing in people from 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 more people from schools in the, in the education partnership more students but also from other schools um, as another way of connecting together um, and I'd see that as as maybe linked to to something where I, I I'm really interested in trying to open up these open up spaces where students and teachers can collaborate um, across schools. And I, I see that climate challenge as an example of a successful example of this. But the collaboration across schools in order to help teachers sustain one another for all, a lot of the reasons that we discussed earlier on. So um, I'd be looking for um, how models, I suppose, how can we, can we draw on, on existing relationships uh, in order to make those spaces sustainable in themselves. One thing that, that we've got experience of in the city, I know is of having some, a lot of enthusiasm and, and genuine, um, passion from from teachers who want to be involved in projects and that gets squeezed um, we've been talking about this uh, through the session i think so spaces spaces that are are kind of really flagged up for for, for, for where those those things can be can be drawn over time Brilliant, thank you. Um, it'd be great if both of you can send me your sort of list of asks. I'll make sure that that's um, brought together and, and we all have copies of that. Um, and I think, I, I guess, on the back of what Maya Rose said, it'd be great to obviously just make more space for young people to be able to chat together to overcome climate anxiety to take action themselves within schools you know whether that's eco clubs or after school activities or as Manu mentioned about mentoring um, so that a lot of the youth-led voice can also really um, be given that space within school um, whilst they're, they're gathered together um, so I guess that would be my additional ask um, there's nothing else come up in the chat, but if anybody else does want to add any other asks, please do either put in the chat or on the Jamboard, that'd be fantastic. Um, the Jamboard's looking great, by the way. Um, thank you so much, everybody who is adding to this. Let me just share my screen so you can see where we're up to at the moment. Um, it probably looks a bit small at the moment, but I will capture all of that and, um, and anything else that comes out of it and um, make sure that everyone has, has a copy of that. 
so that we've got all of those resources and ideas and links um, so that we can take action beyond this session because the last thing we want to do is just be a talking shop and then you go away not feeling empowered to actually do anything else different or better in this in this arena so thank you please keep those coming that's absolutely brilliant um so i think i'd just like to ask um both of you julian and manu just to just for a final word um before we have um uh, the final little film and I just wrap up the session um, just anything else just to sum up that you haven't had a chance to say um, that you'd like people to take away with them before we head into our evenings thank you um, Julian do you want to go first as you're there um, I'd like to pick up on, on something that my Rose said um, which is about a curriculum for hope and uh, I, I, I think that the more conversations I have around this, the more I see that there is um, real grounds for, for hope in, in terms of what's happening in schools now, what, what people want to happen in schools, um, the, the energy and the, the um, conviction uh, around changes that actually equip young people to engage as ethically minded citizens and informed citizens now and on into their adult lives. I think as well um, that looking for opportunities, as Manu has, has um, prompted us to think about, looking for opportunities of weaving issues, well, not even weaving into, but actually making uh, central issues of education for sustainable development and for equity throughout curriculum subjects throughout the life of a school is something that I think we can we can push for we can push hard for I think there is um, there are doors that are already partially open that we can push on for this so I I think with this and with the the real inspiration really of, of what we are being led towards, what we, what I as uh, someone who's probably 15 years older than you, man, I don't know, but, um, who's being led towards in terms of what young people themselves are putting on the agenda and what better an example can we have had than Maya Rose talking to us from the car as she goes down to G7 today um, is, is really inspirational. And I think that is where we can take energy and uh, momentum um, as, as we all continue to, to try to work on these issues. Excellent, thank you. Manu, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Really, really inspiring. And I think I, I always think of, you know, the, the civil rights movement uh, in this country as much as in America, as much as in countries all around the world. I think of the independence movements in South America, Africa, Asia, throughout the 20th century. Um, and I'm convinced we are and have been for a while at a very crucial point in the history of humanity and how our relationship with the planet and our relationship with the things we extract from it and our relationship with each other is incredibly and under uh, you know under scrutiny whether we want to look at it or not is is <laughs> it doesn't matter it, it it just is and i think and i think that comes with the politics not a left-wing politics, not a right-wing politics, uh, not a parliamentary politics, but I think it comes with a politics, you know, to go back to what, you know, the, the Greek word of polity means, you know, uh, people around an issue really is what, is, what, is what I'm talking about. And that, and that teaches, despite the stress, schools, despite the stress of having to deliver on what we talked about as a top-down curriculum, I think we have to stand in solidarity with, with our young people who are screaming and shouting really loudly that you know, these issues cannot, cannot go on. 
And I think, and I think that solidarity and that being vi visible is, on, is reaffirming for young people. It tells them that actually this is not something that is dire and uh, is a cause of constant anxiety, but it is something that we are being supported by these people, you know, in schools who are there to care for you and 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 love you and 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 give you give you a, a better future. And so I think I think despite the challenges of curriculum, despite the challenges of you know planning at twelve at midnight, uh, you know, on a, on a on a Tuesday night. I think when we are in the classroom, it is about listening and being able to learn from these young people who have so much to teach us and standing in solidarity with them. And, and that being the politics that we, you know, that, that we share with them. Um, you know, how, how that pans out in your, in your own context or in your own school is, you know, it's, it's, up, to, it's, up, to, it's up to you, but, I think it's it's really important that we stand in solidarity with 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 young people. Thank you so much to both of you. It's an excellent place in which to uh, to draw our session to a close. I hope that this session has been encouraging for everyone that has taken part. Um, just to see the groundswell of support and the range of ways and possibilities that we can actually take forward these vital issues within the education arena. Um, and I think both teachers and students absolutely want that to happen. And if there's any way that we can empower that, we absolutely will do by sharing resources. Um, and we will also be taking these asks that we've discussed today to um, the city education leaders. So this isn't the end of the story. We hope it's very much, um, and it isn't the beginning, lots of you are working on it already, but it's absolutely a sort of fast forward from here, we hope. Yes, things like the curriculum might take a long time to change, but we're going to take uh, any opportunity we can to, to empower teachers and students to, to explore these issues fully. So thank you so much both to Julian and to Manu, and I will pass on our thanks to, to Maya Rose. I'm so glad she could join us from the road and do seize this time because you know, the G7 is happening imminently. COP26 is being hosted in Glasgow. These are the conversations that are happening. Do email your MP, do write to the education secretary. These issues are on the table and, and we need to be shouting about it now. So thank you so much to the Bristol Education Partnership for hosting us. And um, we will absolutely be following up to share the resources from the Jamboard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Jenny and Julian and Manu for a really, really um, fascinating session. Lots for everyone to think about and take away there. You know, I, I'd like to just make one or two very quick points before um, we close. And the first one is that I think we have to change the curriculum. I know Manu was a little bit depressed about the length of time it would take to do that. But I don't think that's a reason for not thinking about the fact that we do need to have a different kind of curriculum to prepare young people for a very different future. So let's not let go of that. However, um, I don't want to think of this as just a subject for students to study um, because uh, Maya, Rose and others have referred to the absolute importance of building hope. And I think that in order to build hope, we need to get involved in actively doing things to address the issues that surround us. And so protesting is important, but protesting on its own isn't good enough. We actually need to take action um, on projects that tackle um, the problems facing us. And thank you, Julian, for mentioning the Bristol Education Partnership. Um, yes, we're doing great work. Um, the Climate Challenge was our launch project when the partnership started two years ago. And the 10 um, schools uh, that are part of the partnership continue to work on climate challenge projects and are all inspiring each other on projects around reducing energy consumption, eating less meat, increasing um, biodiversity, tackling fast fashion, all these issues. And like you said, collaboration is so important. And when schools learn from each other, they inspire each other um, to, to do more and more. And so, you know, watch this space because the Bristol Education Partnership really is taking this agenda um, very seriously indeed. So huge thanks um, to all of you. Um, most of all, to Jenny for coordinating this session and making sure that it happens. 
and um, you know, let's all stay in touch because you know there's power in strength um, in in working together. And I think you know there is a real will um, to make things happen in Bristol. And and so yeah, I think there's there's possibility with that. So thank you all very much indeed for participating this evening, and um, hope you have a lovely evening. Goodbye. <laughs>